So thanks everybody for um, joining this week's uh, Magnet Seminar. Um, it's in, in a nice uh, late uh, or mid-August uh, uh, schedule. We've had a bit of a disruption in the last couple of weeks with some uh, schedule shifts, but um, uh, we're, we're getting back onto to track again. Um, just a quick reminder for people who haven't come to a Magnet Seminar before, we have presentations that are about 30 minutes long or so. So we kindly ask that you keep your uh, microphones muted um, during the presentation so as not to disturb the um, presenter. If you have problems with your internet connection, we recommend turning off your video to um, allow uh, better bandwidth. And at the end of the presentations, we'll have sort of 10 to 15 minutes um, for questions and discussions. And you're welcome to, to unmute and ask a question, but if you also want to just ask a question by text, you can type it into the chat uh, and I can read it out for you. As always, uh, life is going on around us right now. Many of us are, are at home. So you have, if you have to get up and go, please just uh, get up and go. Uh, that doesn't apply to you, Dave. You have to stay for the duration. Uh, um, uh, but at the end of it all, um, we'll have uh, a chance to uh, have a catch up and a bit of a social at the end. Uh, and that part of our seminars uh, it isn't recorded. Uh, and so today I'm really pleased to have uh, Dave Heslop from Australia, Australian National University, who will be talking about uncertainty propagation in paleomagnetic data. So I will hand over to you, Dave. Okay, thanks, Greg. So let me share my screen. And okay, can you see that okay? That's perfect. Yeah. Okay, well, like I said, thanks, Greg, and, and thanks for the invitation to give this um, seminar. So as advertised, I'm going to be talking about simple uncertainty propagation for paleomagnetic data. And this is something that Andrew and I have been working on for a few years now, and uh, importantly, acknowledge the sponsors. So this was actually funded by the Australian Research Council. Now, a lot of the things I talk about at the beginning are going to be pretty familiar to you. Um, and it's no big surprise that Paleomagnetism kind of has a hierarchical structure, both in the way that we deal with samples and specimens and sites, but also in the way that we deal with our data. So I've got my little schematic here that, you know, we collect specimens from a site and, or samples, and then maybe we're averaging samples to get some kind of site mean direction. And then maybe we're averaging site mean directions to get formation means, and maybe we're going from formation means to paleomagnetic poles, and then onto apparent polar wonder path. So we're really dealing with this hierarchical structure throughout paleomagnetism. So in terms of the data processing, I'm going to refer to this as the data processing chain. Not surprisingly, that's hierarchical as well. So when we start at the, the bottom of the data processing chain, we've got things like specimen remnants directions that we'd assess using PCA and maximum angular deviations. And we're maybe combining specimen directions to give us a, a site mean direction using typically Fisher statistics, but maybe a bootstrap if you've got sufficient observations available to you. Then we could be combining into formation means, paleomagnetic poles, apparent polar wander paths, typically, like I said, always using Fisher statistics. So within this data processing chain or this hierarchy, information is always going from the bottom, specimen remnants directions through to the top. And although we do assess uncertainty at these different levels, so of course with Fisher statistics, we're talking about things like alpha 95s, um, remnants directions, we're maybe using MADs. Typically, we don't actually propagate that uncertainty. So we don't consider the MADs in our specimen directions and think what effect does that have on our site mean directions? Maybe if we've got a collection of site mean directions with their alpha 95s, when we then calculate a formation mean direction, we just ignore those site mean alpha 95s and just carry on with our estimation of a mean. So we don't actually propagate those uncertainties through. Now, it's not as though we ignore the uncertainties completely because we do use things like MADs and alpha 95s maybe a selection criteria if I'm looking at a specimen remnants direction and my MADs over some value like 10 degrees and maybe I say well probably that's not very good and I just remove it from the analysis. Similarly if my alpha 95 is very large maybe I think I won't include that site. So we do use these uncertainties but we don't actually propagate them. So the aims of the project that Andrew and I was working on were to do what I was just talking about, come up with an error propagation scheme that can move through or uh, give us a way to 
propagate uncertainty through this paleomagnetic data processing chain. And we set ourselves a couple of targets as well. We wanted it to be as simple as possible. And by simple, I mean that you don't need some really complex bespoke code for doing this. Rather, it's something that people can just code up themselves in Excel. The other important thing was we wanted it to apply to legacy data. Often with legacy data, you don't have full demagnetization information available by which I mean you know, individual thermal or AFD magnetization steps. So what we wanted was a way to propagate uncertainties from the specimen level without actually having full demagnetization information available. Now, a bit of a spoiler alert, we've, always, we've already published the, um, the paper on this. So uh, if you're interested in some more of the details, this is the paper you need to look for. It's in JGR um, last year uncertainty propagation in hierarchical paleomagnetic reconstructions. And obviously I don't have time to go into all the details here. So the paper is where you need to look. So what I'm gonna talk about is underpinned by the Fisher distribution. Again, something familiar to all of us as paleomagnetists. Um, here's the equation for the Fisher distribution as defined in Fisher's 1953 paper. This is in its matrix form where we're using Cartesian coordinates. But the key thing is, the distribution is defined by a mean and uh, mu and kappa, which is the concentration. So the distribution is rotationally symmetric, by which I mean it has circular contours around the mean. And just to give you an idea of what the concentration parameter is doing, if you imagine I've sliced through a sphere here and I've got a Fisher distribution in blue, then when kappa is, is low, my distribution is very broad and may actually wrap the whole way around the sphere. And as kappa increases, the distribution gets narrower and narrower until we reach a point as we're moving towards infinity where the distribution is infinitely thin. But broadly speaking, with kappa is just the, the width of the distribution. Now, in his 1953 paper, Fisher gave um, what we call maximum likelihood estimates of how for a given set of directions, so imagine we have n directions which are represented by a collection of unit vectors just in Cartesian coordinates x, y, and z, how we can estimate the mean and the concentration of the Fisher distribution that best fits that data. And this is nothing new. If you look in any paleomagnetism textbook, you'll, you'll see these equations. First thing we do is estimate the resultant vector length. We get by adding together all of these unit vector observations. So we just add together the X components, square them, add together the Y components, square them, Z components, square them, add them all together, take the square root. That's our resultant vector length, okay? No big surprise there. And then once we've got that resultant vector length, we can just deal again with the X, Y, and Z components. And this will give us our mean direction of the best fitting distribution. And the mean is mu. Now we also need to work out kappa. This is an expression that maybe isn't quite as familiar because it's typically not given in the textbooks. But this was the expression Fisher developed that relates the resultant vector length to the concentration. Now the difficulty here is that you can't actually solve this equation in an analytical form. If you know R, you can't solve for kappa. So what Fisher did was come up with an approximation for estimating kappa, which is the one at the top here, which again is the familiar one that we see in textbooks where it's simply N minus one over N minus R. So this is the approximate solution to this equation. And it works when we have higher concentrations when kappa equals uh, is greater than three. Subsequently, for example, Banerjee et al. 2005 have come up with a better approximation for kappa. You can see it's still just a function of n and r. So I'm actually going to work with this um, expression from Banerjee, but you can imagine working with Fisher's original expression and it's not going to make a huge amount of difference. Now that's the Fisher distribution in um, Cartesian coordinates, but of course we can also work in spherical coordinates as well, inclination, declination. Again, here's our expression for uh, kappa as a function of um, resultant vector length, which in this case is called A. Now, you may be thinking, Dave, why are you showing us the same set of equations with slightly different nomenclature and they're all fuzzy? And this is maybe one thing, if nothing else you remember from this talk, this is maybe one thing you remember. 
These come from the PhD of Arnold, PhD thesis in 1941 on the spherical probability distributions, PhD thesis from MIT. So Fisher did not discover the Fisher distribution. Arnold discovered the Fisher distribution in 1941. For continuity, I will refer to it as the Fisher distribution for the remainder of the talk. So when we've got our Fisher distribution, how do we actually deal with uncertainty? Given N and R that we saw in a few slides ago, we calculate an alpha 95. Again, we find this in all our paleomagnetic textbooks, and this was something that appeared in Fisher's 1953 paper. So the alpha 95 is this cone of confidence around the mean that means there's a 95% probability that the true mean of the data actually lies somewhere within the alpha 95. Okay, again, very familiar form, but what's this actually based on? Well, what Fisher showed is that if we have a collection of data and we estimate the mean and the concentration, okay, then we've got the best fit to the observations. So we've got a Fisher distribution with a mean of mu and a concentration of kappa. But of course, we don't know the true mean. All we've done is estimate the mean based on the observations that we have available to us. So the distribution of the true mean direction is also Fisher distributed, centered on our estimated mean, but with a, a precision or a concentration equal to kappa multiplied by R. So we've now actually got a, a probability distribution that itself is a Fisher distribution describing the uh, probability distribution of the true mean direction. So if we imagine, let's try and do some error propagation. We're going to take two site mean directions and combine them together. So we've got site A, which is a Fisher distribution. It's got its own mean and the distribution of the mean controlled by the concentration kappa A and RA. And then the same thing for B, but I've just used the Bs here to indicate I'm working on site B. Now, if we were working with standard Gaussian statistics, we could just add together the Gaussian distributions and we'd get a, a resultant Gaussian distribution. And that's great, makes things really simple. And that's what a lot of error propagation is based on, that you add two Gaussians together, you get another Gaussian. The challenge with the Fisher distribution is that if you add together two Fisher distributions, such as our site means here, you don't get a Fisher distribution. So immediately that means that simple hierarchical error propagation is not possible because if, for example, we combine site mean directions, we don't get another Fisher distribution and we can't then calculate a formation mean based on Fisher statistics. So we could throw our hands up in the air and say, well, this is impossible, but maybe we also need a, a healthy spoonful of pragmatism. And what we actually find is that if you add together two Fisher distributions, you don't get a Fisher distribution, but you will get something that's pretty close to a Fisher distribution. So like I said, with this spoonful of pragmatism, what we can do is use a, a technique called moment matching to find which, which Fisher distribution best approximates the sum of a collection of Fisher distributions. Now, I'm not gonna go into the details of moment matching, that's in the paper, um, but what I will do is show you how this works. So again, imagine we've got n site mean directions and we want to take that average, but also propagate in the uncertainty associated with each site mean direction. Now for each site, we calculate a weighting term rho that is just a function of kappa and r from that site mean direction. Okay? Now you may remember this from the definitions by Fisher and Arnold, this just corresponds to the resultant vector length. So what we're doing is representing that distribution, Fisher distribution on the mean as a vector with its length defined according to the expected vector length for a certain concentration in a Fisher distribution. So for each site, we calculate the row term and then we find the weighted mean of those n site directions simply using our weighting terms for each site as we combine the x components to get a resultant um, vector length for the combination of all n site mean directions. So this 
slides very equationy, but what you can see is really, this is exactly the same as the Fisher statistics we talked about earlier. All I've done is add in a weighting term for each site. Once I've got that, I can calculate my mean direction from my combination of site means. Again, just by adding in my weighting term, I can calculate a kappa and I can calculate an alpha 95 that now just employs this resultant vector length where things have been combined according to their weight terms. So what I've done here, like I said, the equations are exactly the same apart from this addition of this simple weighting term. And I've marked this with a little star indicating that this is an alpha 95 that contains error propagation. Okay, so now we've got a way that we can combine together site mean directions with their uncertainties into an average site mean direction with a propagated uncertainty. And importantly, the result is Fisher distributed. So we can continue up the hierarchy. Once I've got an answer from this averaging, I can compare it with other averagings, I can get formation means and so on because everything stays as a Fisher distribution. Now, we need to take a step back. Um, I've been talking about um, site level and site means, but what about the specimen level analysis? Now, of course, uh, typically for specimen level analysis, we're talking about PCA fits through demagnetization data as um, suggested by Coach Joe Kirschvink in 1980. Um, and we get our maximum angular deviations. Now, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, typically we use these for quality control. If my MAD is over a certain value, we maybe throw the specimen out of our analysis. But if we want to um, use this MAD as a measure of uncertainty, we've got to find some way to convert it into a probability distribution. So working with MADs by themselves is not very obvious what kind of uncertainty they actually represent. So somehow we've got to convert this into a probability distribution so that we can include it in our error analysis. Now, this is uh, a, a piece of work Andrew and I did, um, I think it was published in 2016, where we, we placed principal component analysis in a full Bayesian framework in order that we could estimate uh, the uncertainties associated with these specimen level directions. This is difficult for a number of reasons. The, the first one that goes kind of against our project aims is in order to do this, you need full demagnetization data, which isn't always available in the case of legacy data sets. And to be honest, the algorithm to do this is pretty nasty. Okay, so if you read the paper, you'll see all these horrible equations and it isn't a simple analysis to implement. So this isn't something that realistically we can use when we're trying to come up with a simple error propagation scheme. But rather, there's this really nice paper by Kokolov and Herlow, and I, I think this paper is kind of underappreciated. So, you can see that the title from the title, this is going to be particularly helpful. Principal component analysis of paleomagnetic directions converting an MAD into an alpha 95 angle. So this is great. And what they showed through a collection of simulations was that when you do PCA analysis on um, your paleomagnetic or your demagnetization data, the uncertainty on the mean direction that you get from that PCA is Fisher distributed. So this is great because that means it's going to fit into our general scheme of propagating Fisher distributions. And what they showed is that MAD can be rescaled to an alpha 95. And this is really easy to do based on this table that they provided. So for example, if in your uh, PCA, you included five demagnetization steps in your fit, and you, um, you calculate your MAD, and then to get your alpha 95, you just multiply your MAD by 3.18 in the case where you didn't use an anchored fit, but if you used an anchored fit, then you need to multiply it by 4.63. So this is a really easy system to use, and hopefully it means that in the case of legacy data, we can actually uh, still estimate these alpha 95s because as long as we have the inclination, declination, number of demagnetization steps, and if we know if the fit was anchored or unanchored, then we can get an alpha 95 without having the full demagnetization data. So 
we've now got a way to convert specimen level uncertainty into Fisher distributions. And then as I showed, we can just keep propagating that through by using this weighting scheme in order to find the best approximating uh, Fisher distribution. So I'm gonna show you some examples. Uh, this is an example by Bihar et al in uh, 2019, where they were looking at PSV from the Golan Heights. Um, and I should say at this point, I'm showing these examples, not because I'm disputing the findings of these papers or I've got any complaints about them. It's because the data is particularly demonstrative and importantly, they uploaded it to the magic database. So I was able to download it and, and work with it. So we're gonna look at the first site here. Um, what you can see is the site mean directions based on seven specimens, which is pretty good. You can see a lot of the specimens have a high number of demagnetization steps included in their PCA. So anywhere up to 19, 11, nine, that's a, that's a reasonable number of demagnetization steps. And the MADs associated with the, um, with the PCA fits are all pretty small. So we do our Fisher propagation of the uncertainties from the specimen into the site level mean. And what we find is if we just calculated the site mean in the traditional way without error propagation, we get an alpha 95 of 4.7 degrees. When we do it with error propagation, as indicated by the little star, then it comes out as 5.1. So it's not a big increase. And that isn't surprising because we've got a reasonably large number of specimens. They're based on a reasonably large or in some cases, very large number of demagnetization steps, and they've got small MADs. So there isn't a lot of uncertainty associated with these specimens, and that's reflected by only a small increase in the, um, in the alpha 95 at the site level. But let's look at a, a contrasting data set, again from the same study. Now we only have three specimens and a relatively small number of demagnetization steps for each specimen and reasonably large MADs. And what we find, if we just calculate the site mean direction or an alpha 95 without error propagation, it's 1.9 degrees, the alpha 95. You do it with error propagation, it becomes 8.7 degrees, which is clearly a big difference. And again, not surprising, small number of specimens, small number of demagnetization steps, which makes the uncertainty associated with the specimen level directions large. So whereas on the previous site, most of the alpha 95 was dominated by scatter within the directions. In this case, most of the alpha 95 is dominated by the uncertainty on the individual specimens. Now, another example, this is from some um, sedimentary records from Snowball et al. Um, 2013. Again, I'm not going to question the findings of the paper. This was simply that the data was available and I was able to work with it. Um, so they were studying a, a Swedish lake. They had four sediment cores from that lake that they were able to place on a composite depth scale. So the, the four cores are represented by different colored points. They had inclination, declination, and MAD. And then what they wanted to do to um, come up with a, a single composite record was they used a 150 year moving average through the data where they just used Fisher statistics to estimate the mean at each point along the record in this 150 year moving average. So we basically repeated that process, but we did the error propagation for each 150 year window. And this is the result, both in terms of the inclination where you've got the mean of the moving average in black and the 95% confidence interval in, in gray for both the inclination and the declination. So what we actually did in, in this case is we were able to take the alpha 95 error propagated version of the alpha 95 and marginalize those errors into separate errors in the inclination and the declination. So we now have specific confidence intervals on inclination and declination thanks to this error propagation. Now, of course, Snowball et al. did it for four sediment cores in a single lake, but if you're wanting to stack records from multiple lakes, you could use exactly the same process, okay? You're just bringing these things together and propagating the errors. But how much of an effect did the error propagation actually have? So here I've got a plot of the alpha 95 without error propagation, if we just use the standard Fisher statistics, and here's the alpha 95 with error propagation and a one-to-one -one line 
So what you can see for this specific case in the lake sediments is for a lot of the samples or the, the averages in, the, in these 150 year windows, it doesn't make that much difference to include the error propagation. But you can see there's some samples where it does make a big difference. So in over a third of the cases here, the alpha 95 increases by more than 50% when we increase, increase the error propagation. Now, the question is, is that important or not? Really comes down to what question you're asking of your data, okay? So we can, we can estimate these uncertainties and then depending on the inferences that you're trying to draw from your data is really gonna tell you if that change in the uncertainty is, is important or not important. Now, there is one kind of hurdle to this error propagation technique and here's the example again of how we can take samples and sites, formations up to paleomagnetic poles in this natural kind of hierarchical fashion. But once we start working with poles, we typically involve a VGP transform. So we go from our formation means through to our poles via the VGP transform. And we know from the form of the VGP transform that if we're assuming that, for example, our data around here is Fisher distributed, for example, site means, formation means, and so on, then once we VGP transform it, it will no longer be Fisher distributed. The opposite is true as well. A lot of people working in pot with poles and apparent polar wonder paths assume that the data is Fisher distributed. And we know given the form of the VGP transform, if the poles are Fisher distributed, that means the data that went into them, for example, site means, formation means, can't be Fisher distributed. So this actually breaks the assumption of Fisher distributed data at this point. This is something we're still working on at the moment to try and work out how we can get past this hurdle. So it means that you can't go through the entire hierarchy using this Fisher technique because of the need to be GP transform. But all is not lost. Okay, Here, here's an example uh, from a, a paper by Camps et al, where they're looking at late oligocene poles, and they had um, they measured or estimated a new pole and collated uh, poles from a series of publications that they then averaged together. So what we've got in the figure here is their poll and a collection of poles that are then averaged using. Fisher statistics. So even if because of the VGP transform, we haven't been able to propagate uncertainty up all the way from the specimen level, maybe you just start your uncertainty propagation when you start combining poles together. That's okay. It's not a complete error propagation, but it's better than doing no error propagation at all. So these are the collections of pot or the poles collated by Camps et al. They've got the poll that their new poll that they estimated in 2007, and then their collections of polls from the literature. Again, if you combine these with just traditional Fisher statistics, you get an alpha 95 on the mean poll of four degrees. With error propagation, it's four and a half degrees. So it's only gone up a little bit. You may say, what's half a degree? Again, it depends on the question that you're asking of your data. And importantly, if you actually do it with the error propagation, you know that you're not going to be shocked dealing with a traditional mean and then suddenly discover that the uncertainties have a huge influence. So of course, it's always better to work with error propagated estimates if you can. But if we refer back to this um, data from the collation or the collection of Camps et al, what we can see is it doesn't look particularly Fisher distributed. It's kind of elongated like this. And I calculated the best fitting Fisher distribution to the data, which is given by this dashed circle here. And what you can see is it's really quite different to the data itself. So it looks like this data aren't Fisher distributed. We could imagine bootstrapping instead, and the bootstrap allows us to estimate means and uncertainties associated with them, but only when the number of observations is relatively large. Here, the number of observations is kind of small. There isn't some magic number that you can say, if I have this many observations, the bootstrap will work. Um, but what we do know is that if you only have a small number of observations, the bootstrap is going to be pretty unreliable. Now, of course, Looking at these kind of distributions of paleopanic poles is kind of challenging because they do have systematic 
biases in them. For example, if a place is migrating through time, and then I'm looking at poles estimated through a certain time window, then I might see that, that trend of, of the poles that corresponds to the plate motion. So distributions of poles are kind of tricky to deal with, but generally people assume everything's Fisher distributed. Looking at the data here, maybe that isn't the case. But what about PSV? I was talking about the uh, site averaging in the Golan Heights. I talked about the uh, lake sediments in, in Sweden where that was about averaging PSV. So is PSV Fisher distributed? Well, the simple answer is no, okay? So we have these um, giant Gaussian uh, process models of um, secular variation. There's a, a number of different uh, models available. And again, a really nice paper here by uh, Kokolov where they were able to actually map out what the distribution of PSV directions is for these GGP models as a function of latitude. So this is the distribution for zero degrees all the way up to 90 degrees. And I should say they're symmetrical about the equator. So we only need to, in this case, consider positive latitudes. Um, clearly, according to the GGP models, these distributions of PSV are not Fisher distributed. Again, that might be a bit of a problem if we're assuming Fisher distributions in our error propagation. But will the Fisher statistics still work? So I set out to test this and I took one of the GGP models, uh, TK03, which was uh, Torx and Kent in 2003. And the nice thing about these models is if you select a certain latitude, you know from a model exactly what the true or the time average field direction is for the model. Okay, so we can select a latitude and we actually know what the time average field is at that location. We can then draw n random directions from the model that kind of simulate our observations of PSV. We can estimate an alpha 95 using Fisher statistics. And then we ask, is the true mean direction actually within that alpha 95 or not? And we repeat that, for example, 1000 times. So if the Fisher statistics are providing a reliable estimate, then what we'd expect is that the true field mean field direction falls within the alpha 95, 95% of the time. So this is what I did with my simulation. So I did it for different latitudes and different numbers of observations. So you can see here, I'm dealing with really small numbers of observations that are kind of typical of some PSV studies. So what happens when I'm just working with three observations and equals three, four observations, five observations and 10 observations. And what you can see is we're hoping for a value of 95%. And you can see all these values are pretty close to 95%. So even though PSV data are clearly not Fisher distributed, Fisher statistics work well in terms of estimating the mean and the alpha 95 of the observations, even when n is very small, for example, n equals three. Now, if n was large enough, you could just bootstrap and not worry about it. But in a lot of cases, a lot of studies, bootstrapping is not feasible because we just don't have enough observations. So for PSV, at least, it seems assuming a Fisher distribution is going to work just fine. So just to finish off, um, like I said, here's the paper where everything's in and we have um, online calculators for doing these analyses. They're pretty simple. You could code them up in Excel if you wanted to, but we've also got the online functions if you want them. So there's code in GitHub, but also these online calculators where, for example, this is a specimen level. Just for each specimen, you give the declination, inclination, number of demagnetization steps used in the PCA analysis. What's the MAD? Was the fit anchored or not? And then it'll output the result that tells you what the mean direction is and the alpha 95 with the uncertainty included. And if you just use traditional uh, statist uh, Fisher statistics without uncertainty propagation. And you can see the alpha 95s are quite different in, in this case. Okay, so that's all online and available. So to conclude, hopefully we've, uh, I can convince you that we've developed a, a scheme for simple hierarchical error propagation. And all it is, is it takes our existing framework of Fisher statistics and adds a weighting term to it. It's nothing more than that. It works from the specimen level upwards 
So as long as you have inclination, declination, MAD, number of demagnetization steps used in the PCA, and was it an anchored or an anchored fit, then you can do the specimen level uncertainty. It can be applied to legacy data if you have this information. If you don't, then you can just start the error propagation later on in the sequence. For example, when you start dealing with combinations of site means. Fisher statistics appear to be appropriate to handle PSV directions when bootstrapping is infeasible. And as I just said, we've got code available, Python code and online calculators, which you can find via my website, which is the address here. So I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. I think we can give Dave a, a virtual round of applause for um, a really actually really interesting talk. I've certainly got a couple of questions uh, to throw your way. Um, we can open the floor uh, to anybody else with some questions. So if you um, just want to raise your hand through through Zoom and you can ask Dave a question. Otherwise, I'll just jump in with my one. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I'll kick it off then. Um, so at the start, you're, you're, you're saying that, you know, when you add two Fisher distributions together, they're, they're not Fisher distributed, but we can approximate yep. them as being Fisher distributed. Yep. I mean, does does that approximation hold if we're summing up an arbitrary number of Fisher distributions or, or does yep. it start to break down? So what you, yeah, I should, in the paper, we, we clarify this. Um, and it's also what is the best matching or best approximating Fisher distribution. So it actually uh, specifically uses the callback and Liebler divergence metric. So we can actually from that calculate how much deviation there is away from the sum to the Fisher distribution that we're approximating it with. So we can actually we actually have a divergence measure to quantify that. Okay, um, is that then is it sort of recommended to use that then to assess whether or not the assumption is valid and whether or not the error propagation is, is, is valid then? Yeah, so at the moment, we, we, for example, don't provide threshold values to say, this is acceptable, this is not acceptable. I'm not, yeah. I'm not a big fan of these magic values that on one side of it, you're perfectly okay, and then you take a tiny step <laughs> over and suddenly everything's gone wrong. You know? yeah. So a little bit of judgment is required on these deviations and what is a big deviation and what is a small deviation. So at least I can say we can measure the level of deviation, then how you choose to use that is a slightly different question that I'm not going to attempt to answer. That's <laughs> a, very, a very pragmatic <laughs> approach. Yeah. Uh, so does anyone else have some, some questions for, for Dave? Uh, uh, I've, 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 I've got a, this is probably a dumb question. So, um, but when you're talking about the, the challenge of going from uh, site mean directions to the VGP transform. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't it reversible? So couldn't you just, I guess, why can't you just uh, uh, say, get your VGPs and then convert to like a common site mean direction and then presumably that's now Fisherian or is that not gonna work for the error propagation? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. So I, I think probably the, the best way to do it is a similar step where you do the transform and it's like, and, and I think this is what you suggested, and then you find the best Fisher fit to that transform. Um, and maybe that works fine, or maybe you have something that's clearly not Fisherian. Um, and I think that's where people actually need to be looking at their data and checking what's happening and actually making this, uh, even if it's just a graphical assessment to say, no, this clearly isn't Fisherian anymore. I shouldn't be assuming a Fisher distribution. But I, I think that's the natural way to get through the transform is to approximate everything as Fisher, transform it again, and then find the best approximating Fisher distribution again. Um, and I think maybe we need to run some simulations to just see how much of an issue that could actually be, or if it's a reasonable assumption to make. Um, we work with um, people over in the Department of Statistics here at ANU who are, who are experts on statistics on spheres. And I showed them the VGP transform and asked them if they were able to work out what a Fisher district or the equation for a Fisher distribution would be once it's been VGP transformed. 
and I got a I got a, a one sentence email reply which would be this is not obvious <laughs> so considering these people are world experts in these things I, I, I think my chances of coming up with it are, are slim to none and it and it sounds like it might be a difficult problem to try to tackle um, so maybe just sticking with a best fitting Fisher distribution might be the way forward no that makes sense thank you uh, do you have any any other questions to, to throw Dave's way? Excuse me, this is Shige yep. Shibuya uh, from, from Osaka. And and the, the uh, I, I'm asking that the, what is what the alpha 95 means that the uh, VGP is not in the Fisher distribution. Yeah, well, that's a good question. It could be almost meaningless. I mean it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it depends. So I guess it depends how much your data deviates from um, a Fisher distribution. So we saw in the case of PSV that even though mm -hmm. the data isn't Fisher distributed, the Fisher statistics will still still do a good job. And oh, yeah. we can we can readily test that numerically because we have these GGP models. I think it's more difficult to test with um, polls because yeah. yeah we can't really simulate poles in an obvious way that we can do these kind of um you know monte carlo type assessments of of how well the things are behaving mm -hmm. so it's like all statistical processes though if if your data don't meet the assumptions of the statistics then your statistics mm -hmm. will give you a spurious result so that's always important for the users to remember that they can't just blindly put the numbers in there and expect what they get to actually mean anything you know this is old computer science adage of garbage in equals garbage out um so yeah i i can't really comment on that i i think it it may be about the community having a more detailed conversation um i know lisa for example would say you should be bootstrapping um and yeah, 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 yeah. Bootstrapping um, is one, one, uh, one solution I, I believe yes yeah but you know one of one of the limitations of the bootstrap is it doesn't have any paramag uh, paramagnetic any parametric parametric uh -huh. even uh -huh. parametric uh -huh. assumption yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. but you have to have a large enough sample size in order for it to be um robust yeah so if yes, dealing yes, with yes. n equals three n equals four that's something you can't bootstrap <laughs> Um, yeah, you and can. then you, because you're lacking information in your sample, you have to replace that with information in your assumptions, which is mm -hmm. with distributed or, or so on. You know. Another point is that uh, some kind of hierarchy, hierarchy, yeah, hierarchy uh, mm -hmm. statistical system, the, the cause of error is different in, in each hierarchy. So alpha 95 or K mm -hmm. are different in each hierarchy. Are there any any way to sum this hierarchical difference in the uh, cause of error? Well, so so in the hierarchy, you you reestimate kappa and r at each step in the hierarchy, depending on if yeah, you're dealing yeah. with sites or formations or so on. So it's a mm -hmm, continuous mm -hmm, process mm -hmm. of, of reestimating the parameters at each at each level mm -hmm. in the hierarchy. Again, just by these so, standard Fisher statistics with the weight term included. Yeah, uh, um, 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 alpha uh, estimate of alpha ninety five is quite uh, quite good, right? but uh, estimate of k or delta is a little bit different. So each each step uh, k and or delta is, must be different. So the uh, whole k does not mean anything, right? Well, so what you would have, for example, for each, if you do a combination of site means, mm -hmm. each site mean would have a, a kappa or a k value. Mm -hmm. And then when you, um, and an r value associated with it. And then when you mm -hmm. combine into the formation, you would mm -hmm. use those kappas and r's to formulate a new Fisher distribution for your formation. Mm -hmm. And that distribution has its own cap and R. So then if yeah, you've yeah. got that for some formations, you're just combining them. So it, it really is just a re-estimation of mm -hmm. each site, each formation, and, and mm -hmm. so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So thank you very much, Sir Sir Boyer. So I'll yeah. to I'll just keep a, a, a quick eye on, on our, our time. Oh, sorry, um, sorry. No, that's no, not a problem. And um, does anybody else have a, a question to, to throw uh, Dave's way? I have one very quick one, Dave. Can this the same principles be applied to inclination only uh, data? Um good question. I at a at a first guess, I think they probably could, because the the statistics for inclination data is still based on Fisher distributions, but it's, integ it's integrated over declination. So the yeah, so the declination is kind of integrated out. So I think it it should be possible. If that's of interest to people, then you know I can I can take a look more deeply at it. I think there's a whole uh, whole uh, drilling community that might uh, might find that quite useful. No, because you just rotate everything to have an average declination. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Sorted. Excellent. So, you well, know, kind of, it's the kind of thing while we're here. I'll say yes. It's it's simple. It's easy, and then um, I'll go quiet on that for about eighteen months. So, yeah. And then, and then get a one-line email saying it's not very obvious. It's not very obvious, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much, Dave, uh, for a great talk. Okay. We'll give Dave another um, virtual round of applause through uh, through our Zoom. Uh, and just before we uh, come to a close, um, just allow me to um, wrap up with a, a last little bit of housekeeping. Um, so we'll, we're going to have a, a, a short break. Um, for IAGA, um, we don't want to, to, to overlap with a, a, the other conference, um, but we'll be back in September, on September 8th, uh, with a speaker who's, who's to be confirmed. Uh, we have somebody lined up, but we're, we don't want to announce them until they say absolutely yes. Uh, and then we've got a couple more uh, presenters on this uh, Eastern Hemisphere European uh, time slot. And then in October, we're actually going to move back to um, the European Americas time slot for, for, for the remainder of, of the year. So apologies to people who will be in bed at that time, but um, you'll be able to catch up on, on our magnet seminars with, uh, with the YouTube channel. Uh, and as always, we're looking for, for uh, future speakers. Um, we've filled up our schedule for 2021, so we're looking for anybody who's interested in, in presenting uh, next year. And as always, we're, we really want to encourage um, early career uh, researchers. So please just um, get in touch. And as I sort of mentioned, um, you can catch up with all the Magnet Seminars uh, on our, our YouTube channel. So thank you all very much for, for uh, joining Magnets today. Cheers.